13. This is a Sunday night. I know that very, very well. And uh, when I was in the process of um, preparation of this message, I, I knew it was for Sunday night. It's certainly not a Sunday morning, simply because, to be very honest with you, the time constraints of Sunday morning and then also... And it's not that I make it the hard, fast rule because um, I, I, I want to be open for the Holy Ghost. I really, 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 really do. But it does seem like the Holy Ghost is uh, very fond of reaching out for the lost. And so we have our greatest number of visitors on Sunday morning. And so that's mostly where we end up going, which is wonderful. That's what it's all about. And, but God's also been very, very good to give us souls, Holy Ghost baptized Sunday night, wherever we go. But we generally just tend to kind of have a lot of fun on Sunday nights. And tonight, uh, I just, I, I, I feel like, uh, forgive me if I make this statement that I have a, I feel like talking to you spirit on me. Okay. I know I'll do more than just talk. It'll. Every now and then, maybe we'll ring a bell or something. I don't know. But I do know I want to take the time to convey, hopefully, that when I'm done, everybody's got the picture, regardless of your age. And, and I really do think that I have something that can help us. I know it can help me. And I was talking to two people before church, had some meetings, and our conversation went along the line. I just had, I had to let them know. I showed them my notes, what I'm, at least the title, what I'm fixing to preach. Um, everybody needs this sometime. First Corinthians 13, beginning with verse number 9, for we know in part... And we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part or partial or portional, it's going to be done away. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly. But then, if I can interpolate, we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. I got a little bit of the picture. But then shall I know even as also I am known. What do you say we pray together? And let's ask that God really would come down in his goodness and mercy and really talk to us. We need the Lord to talk to us. Lord Jesus, you're a good, great, gracious, wondrous, wonderful God. Far better than we deserve. And we know that right well. But Jesus, we thank you for your love and your faithfulness and your care, your concern, and how you watch over your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you so much. You may be seated. Now, uh, in our text here, the Apostle Paul is has been working and is going to be working. He's, has it been working on uh, gifts of the Spirit? He's going to come back and do the same. A number of things. For all of that, we'll just set it aside. I want to really focus in on this portion. And he's letting us know that our knowledge of life, 
our knowledge of things, our knowledge of the kingdom, our, our knowledge of our ways and of God's ways and his dealings with us, we all see some things, we've all experienced some things, but everything that we have, you can mark it down, we have it in partial allotments. Nobody's got the entire bag of marbles. Nobody sees it all, knows it all, understands it all, fathoms it all, but God. I will take it a step further. The angels do not see and know in fullness at all. They do not. They do not. We know that, among other things, they know a lot more than we do, but but it's partial. It's partial with them. Angels are finite beings, like we are finite beings. They're not quite as finite as we are. They can get around and mobile much quicker, faster, etc., stronger, you name it, than we are uh, and we do. But their, their knowledge is limited. It is limited. There are things they know, that, um, that, but, but they, they, they don't see it all clearly. Only God sees it all. But there is coming a time, he states that there is a time of perfection coming when that which is in part shall be done away. And in that day, we shall judge angels. We will have, not that we will be infinite, and and don't ask me to explain exactly what we're going to be like, because I don't know. I, I just don't know. But I know we're going to judge angels. I know that in this life, we're made a little lower than the angels, but in the next life, we're going to be the judges of angels. And so when this corruption puts on incorruption and this mortality puts on immortality, it's going to be a different world. And I can only speak as far as I can go because I know in part. I'm like everybody else. We're just doing the best we can with what we've got. But I also am told that there is a time of perfection coming when that which is partial is going to be done away. So obviously, whatever all else that means, our view and our understanding is not going to be as nearly, nearly as limited as it is now. And I know that the next verses, 11 The next verse 11 has been used for many, many, many things. And it has been applied to many situations, and that rightfully so. When God gave us the scripture, he knew that it would be used as a key that would unlock several doors. But nevertheless, there is the number one, first, foremost, main door that he meant for us to understand when the Apostle Paul gave it to us. And then other things are just uh, nice to have and helpful, of course. But when the Apostle Paul is trying to describe our partiality now or that which is, is so narrow purview compared to that which we're going to have, he likened it unto when he was a child. And the understanding that he had when he was a child. And you may not have all of that great a memory of what all you could comprehend when you were a child. But if you are a parent, you readily know and can relate to the fact that children see in part. They don't see nearly what you see. Children do not understand nearly what you understand as an adult. A four-year-old does not understand what a 14-year-old understands. There's no way. It's not even a comparison. Amen. And a 14-year-old, whether they like to believe it or not, amen, does not understand what a 40-year-old understands. They may think they do, but trust me, they don't. I know I thought I knew a lot, but I found out I didn't know nothing except how to get in trouble, and I didn't know how to get out of it. And God, in his mercy, helped me. So when he was a child, Paul said, I spoke like a child. When I was a child, I understood like a child. When I was a child, I thought like children think. But he said, now I'm a man. 
When I became a man, I put away childish things. I don't see like a child. I don't think like a child. I don't talk like a child anymore. That which was so narrow has been added to daily, both through bodily change, amen, um, even your, your, uh, your frontal, uh, if they take it out, they call it a frontal lobotomy, your frontal lobes uh, are not even fully developed until you're 21 years of age, and your frontal lobes have to do with realms of judgment, literally, it, until you're 21 your frontal lobes aren't even fully developed. And, and so your judgment faculties have not come until they're full until you are at least around 21 years of age. Which means that prior to your frontal lobes coming to that point, you're going to do a lot of things instinctually and you're going to do a lot of things emotionally based on emotion because there's not as much rationale used. There is more of that which is emotional that is used rather than rational. And uh, so then your frontal lobes kick in, and it's like, oh, you don't wake up on your 21st birthday, birthday and say, oh, I was so stupid yesterday. You don't do that. But it's just, it, it, it's, it's just the way that life works. And then you get a host of experiences, good experiences, bad experiences, good decisions, bad decisions. You find out what works. You find out, hopefully, what does not work. And, and if you've got any kind of acumen at all, you learn from your mistakes. You learn from your mistakes. Now, I'm talking ostensibly to a group of Christians here. I know that not everybody yet has been baptized in Jesus' name, repented, or received the Holy Ghost. But you're in the right place at the right time, praise God. And you're here because God really does love you. And I mean that. I mean that with all my heart. So those of us that have, by the mercies of God, been called to repent and did so and commanded to be baptized, and we, we did so and, and received the gift of the Holy Ghost, which by the grace of God, he did so. Uh, you get experiences in life. You have a, a Bible that is given us to instruct us and teach us in the ways of righteousness. That the man of God, the people of God, can be perfect, thoroughly, completely furnished unto every good work. This book is a light unto our path. It is, it is the wisdom. It is the wisdom of the ages. And when I see how little the Bible is used, even in churches, let alone society, I, I'm, I'm appalled. I'm, I'm, I'm utterly, absolutely amazed. Amazed, amazed, amazed at how little it is used. And, um, and, then, and then I say that, and then when I get and I cross the river, I'm going to look back and realize how much I missed. How much I missed. So we have the Bible, and we have experiences, and we have the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. So when we were children, we, we saw things like children see them. Like a child will see a $20 bill in your wallet, fathers, and think you're the richest man in the world. And why can't we go to Thrifty's and buy a $4 ice cream? What's wrong with you? You said we don't have money. And I remember when I moved to California, they were 15 cents. And you could get three big scoops for 45 cents. Well, it, those days are gone. Okay? But if you got a $20 bill and your kids see that, they think it's time to go to McDonald's. Because, Dad, you've got money. But as you grow and you start paying the bills you realize that you can have thousands of dollars in the bank and be flat busted because you know, amen, that this time tomorrow it's all going to have to be spent. And you're really literally broke, et cetera, et cetera. And so you see things different than when you were a child and you understand things different and you then you, and you speak things different because you become a man. When you become a man or full-grown woman, you also, by the mercies of God, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, experiences, hearing of the word of the Lord, reading of the word of the Lord, hearing of stories, situations, all of these things are supposed to come into us to mold us and make us and help us to grow 
in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But in our best estate, Paul is stating, we still see in part. We still know in part. And the, and the closest analogy he could give is what it's going to be like is so much different than now, right now. Where we're headed is going to be so much different than now. The closest analogy he could bring it up is, is go back to when you were a little child. You saw, you thought, you spake, you understood like a child. It was a different world than what it is now. And he's stating when that which is perfect has come, it's going to be that big a quantum leap for us than where we're at right now. So, he said, verse 12, what we're doing is we are seeing through a glass darkly. We can all see, we can all view by the grace of God, but the glass is a dark glass. And there's a lot of things you can't quite make out. Maybe you can catch outlines and, and movements, but maybe you can't pick up faces if the glass is too dark. And, and so it is. There's things you can know and, you know, have a certain amount of intuition. Maybe it's correct. Maybe it's not. But, but, but we're looking through a glass dark mentally, emotionally, even spiritually compared to where we are headed. Okay? Right now I know in part, but in that day I'm going to know even as also I am known. Now this is a huge statement because how are we known? David said, I'm going to tell you how much I'm known. He knows my down sittings and my uprisings. He knows my thoughts are far off. He knows the words that I speak before they get off the end of my mouth. He knew me when I was in my mother's womb. He knew me and had every member of my body already written down before one portion was formed. He had my fingers, my fingernails, my eyes, my eyebrows, lids, ears. All of these things were written down, the number of hairs, before I was even formed in the womb. It was there. He saw that I would, buy, I would grow. I would grow continually. And so it is the Apostle Paul speaks of us who desire for immortality and by patient continuance, we're continually growing, 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 here a little, there a little, getting this, getting that, a little more understanding here, a little more enlightenment there. But we know in part that God who knows us perfectly says in that day, we're going to know as much as we are known now that's huge. It can't become infinite. I know that. There is a, there's, there's a throttle on this gear. Amen. There's, there, there's, there's, a, there's, there's, a, a, there's a problem with this accelerator. Somewhere, we won't all be infinite because we'd all be Jehovah God. He's the only truly infinite one, but he's letting us know we're going to know a whole lot more than we know now. Okay? And uh, this is why Amplified puts this on this wise. For our knowledge is fragmentary, incomplete, imperfect. And, and we prophesy in part. We get a little portion here, a little portion there. And... And they believe that uh, uh, teaching is prophecy, which is not. But, but even, even our prophecy or our teaching is fragmentary. It's incomplete. It's imperfect. The best I can give you, the best that I can give you, it's still fragmentary. But when the complete and perfect total comes, the incomplete and imperfect will vanish away, become antiquated, void, superseded, and when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but now I've become a man, I'm done with childing, childish ways. I've put them aside. For now, we are looking in a mirror that gives only a dim, blurred reflection of reality as if it's a riddle, as if it's an enigma. But then when perfection comes, we shall see in reality face to face. Now I know imperfectly, I know in part, but then... I shall know and understand fully and clearly, 
even in the same manner as I have been fully and clearly known and understood by God. My friend, Brother Steve Buxton, has a sign in his office that he got from Sister Barbara Terry. Or maybe he got it from Brother Terry. I don't know. But it's a little sign. I used to see it in his front room. It's a fabulous little sign. And it was so like Brother Terry in his unique nature. But all the little sign said was, no one has all the facts. No one has all the facts. Of course, the rest of the statement could have been, and we know, but God. Brothers and sisters, God has all the facts. None of us do. Nobody's got all the facts. We know in part. We see in part. Our, our spiritual lobotomies, amen, our, our, our spiritual frontal lobes are still yet to be developed and some of us have had frontal lobotomies. In the, but anyway, be that as it may. Uh, when I'm talking tonight about our restricted conditions and our ever so finite ways, I'm, I'm not trying to incapacitate us. I'm not trying to demobilize, demobilize us from taking action from saying statements like, well, I don't know, I'm I'm stupid, I don't know what to do, I I, I, I don't know. But I don't want to demobilize, I don't want to incapacitate us because God wants people to be a people that get things done. But uh, I do want us to stop and realize that maybe, among many other things, we should all least be a little more cautious in not rushing to judgment on people and on situations. Now, sometimes, absolutely. But there still needs to be something in there that says, I see in part, I know in part, only God has all the facts. I've given some analogies. Uh, I'm glad I had this experience. Some of you have heard this before. Some of you have heard it before two or three times. That doesn't bother me a lick. Because many of you have never heard it. And this time next year, there'll be more that haven't heard it. And this time, if the Lord tarries three or four years from now, there'll be a bunch of people that haven't heard it. And so we would keep repeating because, because that's part of what I do is try to impart truths and certain lores and that, that, that people can embrace and rally around and have with him. Be all that it may, I remember I was a young man and uh, I was preaching. God was good to me. Uh, I, I, the first almost five years I was in church, I read nothing, nothing but the Bible. I might on occasion read a newspaper. I read no novels, periodicals. If I didn't, excuse me, I, I didn't read anything except the Bible or if it was a book about the Bible, it had to be about the Bible for me to read it. I didn't, I just, I didn't go there. Nothing for leisure, nothing for uh, uh, resting my mind or whatever. It was just strictly Bible. I studied voraciously and, uh, uh, and I could just, I had a man inspire me to do that, old brother Henry Ivey. And, and I dived into the pool of study for five years, almost five years. And uh, we prayed and fasted a lot. Um, my wife will tell you, I probably, I, this isn't true, but she thinks it is. So I, she says it, but I know it's not true. She said I fasted more than I ate. I don't think that is true. I know that's not. But I do know, I know what I weigh right now, and I've just lost a lot of weight but I weighed 110 pounds less than I do right now. 113 pounds less than I do right now. I don't know of a man in this church as skinny as I was. I was so skinny, I looked sick. Literally. It's not a, when I see my pictures, it's not that guy's in bad shape. And, uh, but there I was. And, uh, and the Lord was kind. And there was, uh, and there was this, Special sweet anointing. 
and God would help us. And because God helped us so much and we were preaching so much and going and doing so much, you know, you kind of get, if you're not careful, you get to think you know the score. You get to think that maybe you're a little smarter than some of the people you're preaching for. And that you got better insight. And, 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 and I was, please understand, I was never, ever, God knows, so stupid as to ever make a remark like that. I was ne- not to my wife, not to myself in private. But you get, you know, you think, boy, if I had this church, I could do something with it. Stuff like that. You know, you're just an idiot. And, uh, and so I remember, here we go, some of you remember this, but I, I, was, I was holding a revival, and there was, I'd, I'd preached in that church before. Uh, more than once, several times. And there was a good woman in that church. She was a mother in Israel. She was a great woman. She was a truly great woman. She was a prayer warrior. She was, we have ladies in this church like her. She was just one of them. And, uh, and, and so I came to hold this revival, and I noticed there was nada. Nada. She would look at me. She wouldn't respond to the preaching. She wouldn't respond to the altar calls. She wouldn't come and pray. She would pray with nobody. And this would, had never been her style. And um, she looked good. She looked fine. She could talk to you. And, uh, and I would reach for her. I, I, and, and the family, I found out, was scared. They were scared because I brought it up to the pastor. I said, what is wrong with sister so-and-so? She, he said, we don't know. She's, he said, I think she's maybe backsliding. He said, the, the kids are scared to death. And and so, and I love this lady. She was a good, 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 good woman. And so I reached for her with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind. I reached for this woman. I could almost cry right now. I, uh, I was under burden. I reached so hard trying. I wouldn't call her name. I wouldn't embarrass her. I have never been into that. But uh, I'd reach so hard for this woman's soul and, and to break her out of whatever was binding her and, and, and because I was reaching so hard and I'm not bragging, it was the Lord there was such a heavy, heavy anointing everything else in the place was praying through like crazy and new people were coming in that was, and, and when everything in the house would be at the altar she'd be sitting there looking at me she'd smile and after service you know People, she would make her way. She'd make sure to come up to me. She'd shake my hands with both hands. And she'd say, that was such a beautiful message. Thank you so much. And I wanted to scream, then why don't you pray? But I didn't. I just I said, thank you. And we closed the revival. And she never moved. She never budged. And a few months later, she was dead. Because she had a tumor in her head the size of a man's fist. And her problem wasn't spiritual. And it was one of the greatest things that ever happened to this young, smart kid that thought he knew. Brothers and sisters, we see in part, we know in part, We look through dark glass. There's so much we miss. We don't know. We think we know. You've heard me tell of the man on the on the subway. Rode the subway, the same subway. Every night he knew where to sit. He had his paper, had it down pat. And a man comes and sits down across from him. Of course, the knees kind of crowded. And he's got he's got three, I can't remember now, four little kids. They're little and they're crazy. God crazy. The kids are running up and down. They're jostling people. They're back and forth. They're jostling his newspaper. And the man's oblivious. He's oblivious. He's just, he's just sitting there. And the kids are going nuts. And the man's not doing anything. He's not saying anything. And the man can't even read his paper. And he folds his paper up. He says, sir, sir, don't you think you need to get your kids in hand? They're making everybody in this car miserable and you're doing nothing about it and and the man he, he said, i i'm so sorry 
I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't notice. He, he got up and he would get his kids. He gathered them and he put them between him and the seat. And he was holding the squirmiest kid. And, and they were sitting there. And they're still, but the man's sitting there trying to read his paper. And he's mad. And then on the other side of the paper, he hears the man almost talking to himself. His voice isn't loud. He's not trying to explain. He's just talking. And he says, my, we're going home from the hospital. My wife just died. Their mama's gone. And maybe it's just their way of trying to handle it. They don't know what to do. I'm, I'm so sorry. And the man on this side of the newspaper, once he saw, once he understood, once he knew the score, he felt like the biggest jerk in the world. It was very healthy for him very healthy for us, for him. And somewhere in our lives, God lets all of us put our foots in our, our feet in our mouths and think things, shoot off things. Do, and, and then we find out he didn't really quite know. This is why the same apostle in the same book makes another reference here, and uh, it's in the 8th chapter. He says, now, as touching things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. We all know some things, okay? Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And one puts it on this wise, now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The rest of it goes to say in verse 2, And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. Or as another puts it, the man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. Another one says, if anyone thinks he knows all the answers, he's just showing his ignorance because he really doesn't know. Another one says, of course we know all that all of us possess knowledge concerning these matters, yet mere knowledge causes people to be puffed up, to bear themselves loftily and to be proud. But love, affection and goodwill, he goes on in, first in, in, in the King James, but if any man love God, the same is known of him. Can I tell you, God is going to know if you love him. He knows what you know. But what you know will never impress him because we know as a child knows compared. But I will tell you what does impress him is, this, is how much you love him. That is the commodity that he's looking for, is how much you love him. Because he says, if any man... Uh, but love, affection, goodwill, benevolence edifies and builds up and encourages one to grow to his full stature. If anyone imagines that he comes to know or understand much about divine things without love, he does not yet perceive and recognize and understand as strongly and clearly, nor has he become as intimately acquainted with anything as he ought or is necessary. But if one truly loves God with affectionate reverence, prompt obedience, grateful recognition of his blessing. He's known by God. He's recognized as worthy of his intimacy and love. He is owned by him. So it's not so much what we know nearly as what the condition of our heart is. 
How much do I love you, Jesus? How much do I recognize how bad I need you? I've got to have you. Now, I'm going to step back from this. Then, I'm going to throw some more into the mix of this knowing in part, understanding in part, compared to that which is infinitely perfect. Then you add to the fact the times and seasons that come into people's lives. Ecclesiastes 3 really is an unbelievably profound scripture in many levels. To everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. So it's not even so much as, as what you know or don't know, but it also, you got to work into the equation, what is the season? What is the season? Because seasons make the world of difference for so many things. Now, we live here in Southern California. We don't have to deal with a foot of snow, right? We got that. The only time I remember it snowing and it's sticking on the ground and seeing it on the roof of a house in, in, in Rialto was the first night of our tent revival, praise God. And Philip called me and he said, Dad, and we prayed for every kind of weather. We said, God, don't let it rain. God, don't let the wind blow. We, we prayed for every kind of weather. Well, why would I pray God, don't let it snow? And, and he, said, he said, have you looked outside? And I said, no. He said, I think you might ought to look outside. And it was the morning that we were starting the tent revival. It was all set up. And I looked out there, and there is snowing, fall, snow falling, and probably an inch of snow on the ground. There's snow on his house. And I cracked up laughing. I fell on the bed, cracking up. My wife said, what's so funny? I said, it's snowing. She said, snowing. I said, yes. I said, we prayed for every kind of weather, but we didn't ask about snow. Amen. But it was all gone. By that night, we got heaters, and we still had 140. Get the Holy Ghost in three nights. Praise God. He's a big God. He's a mighty God. But, you know, you get into these seasons. It was a season. It could have snowed. Who would have ever dreamed? But you have to also know the seasons. We don't live in other parts of the country where I have lived where you better know your seasons. You better know your seasons, okay? If your car has air conditioning, you really want it to work, okay? And if your home has it in the summer, you really want it to work. And in the winter, you really want your heater to work. You may get by with it out here without it, but you really want it to work because the seasons are huge. And so in life, you have to know your seasons because there's a, a season and a time for everything. There's a purpose. There's a time to be born. There is a time to die. And we don't like that, but it happens. It's going to happen to all of us unless the trumpet catches us first. And there's a time. There is a time for everything. There's a time to plant. I know all about planting. Yes, but do you know about the seasons of planting? There's a time to pluck up that which is planted. There's a time for reaping. But you have to know your seasons. There's a time to kill, and there's a time to heal. There's a time to break down and build up. There is a time to weep, and there is a time to laugh. And if you get those confused, you're going to be in trouble. There's a time to mourn, and there's a time to dance. There's a time to cast away stones and get them together. Time to embrace, a time to refrain, a time to get, and a time to lose. There's a time... Amen, that things come your way. And there's times that everything goes away. It's just there's times and there's seasons. It may not have anything to do with you being right, wrong, or anything else. It's just what season is this? There's times to keep and cast away and rend and sow and keep silence and speak and love and hate in a time of war and a time of peace. And then it goes on, amen, he made everything beautiful. In verse 11, God made everything beautiful in his time. As far as God is concerned, it's all beautiful because he made it in his time. But we got to get in step with his timing. And that's, that's a whole lot easier to say than it is to do. 
because we're such creatures of habit and we're such creatures of partial knowledge and we're such creatures of, of a thing called a self-will. We're such creatures of, of, of judgmentalism. And I don't mean that in, in a horrible way, though it can be a horrible way. We have to make all kinds of judgments every day, all day long. Amen. A judgment. A judgment. Amen. Is that car really going to stop? Is that, car, is that car going slow enough to make that stop sign? Is, 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 am I going to make it through that yellow light? Amen. Am all kinds of judgments. Am I going to fit into this parking spot? You name it. It doesn't stop. We make judgments all day long. Well, we, because we have to make so many judgments all day long, it's hard just to shut that off and say, I don't know. Because we, we know so many things, seemingly. So, but then you got to know your seasons. you got to know what. God made everything beautiful in his time. But he also went on to say, he did another thing too. He put this world in the heart of man so that no man could find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. God set it up that it's hard for us to know the seasons. It's hard for us to figure it out. Now we see in part, we know in part, we look through a glass darkly, we're utterly finite, amen. Then God puts the world in our heart to keep us from being smarter than we are. So you got a lot of things here that you have to recognize, swallow, somehow wrap your heart, mind, and brain around it and do the proper things with it. Don't get frustrated. Don't get mad. Don't get sad. Just say, this is life. Get over it. I got I to gotta handle it the best I can. One puts it on this wise. Everything is appropriate in its own time. But though God has planted eternity in the hearts of man, even so, many cannot see the whole scope of God's work. He did so. Man could not see the whole scope of God's work from the beginning to the end. So I go back. We see through a glass darkly. Then we go on. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Where, and, and I'm not, I'm, I'm closer to being done than maybe you think. Second Corinthians 4 verses 6 through 8. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. By the mercies of God. He has shined in our hearts. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We know in part and we see in part. But I'm going to tell you that's a part you better get down. Is that the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. We ain't, we're not going to know everything in this life. But there's some things we better know. We better know who Jesus is. And we better know what we're going to do with him. We need to live for him. We need to fall on that rock and be broken. We need to yield ourselves and surrender ourselves to him. Amen. We surrender in repentance. We surrender in baptism. We surrender when we receive the Holy Ghost. You understand you have to surrender to come to an altar and pray. You have to surrender to repent. You have to surrender and say, you get wet all the way wet? You mean like complete? Yeah, yes. You surrender. And, and you don't get the Holy Ghost because you stand there. I want it now. You hear me? Give it. It don't happen. Amen. You worship him, and as he begins to fall on you, you are lifting up your hands. You are worshiping God. You're surrendering, and you're loving him. And then when he begins to start to, you're, 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 you're praising God, and, he, and, and there's other vowels and syllables wanting to come out of your mouth, and you want to keep it straight, praise God. And there's people around saying, let go, let go. And, 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 and saying, come on, don't worry about what it sounds like. That's the Holy Ghost wanting to speak through. You have to yield. And then he begins speaking in a language you never learned before. Amen. So the whole process is surrender. It is yielding to him. So, so whatever we know or don't know, we better get some things down right. And that is, I want to obey. I want to obey the gospel. I've got to know the gospel. Let me know the gospel. Somebody teach me a Bible study. I've got to know what it takes to be saved. And then, and then once I'm saved, I need to know what I need to do to live for God. 
I want to please him. I want to walk with him. How important is coming to church? How important is, is hearing and studying the word of God? How important is praying and seeking my master's face? How important is it loving my brothers and my... How important? How important? I don't even know how important it is. Because I just have a spectrum that's small. It's finite. God knows it's everything. It's everything. But God commanded light to shine out of darkness. He has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Here's the conundrum, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What a shame. Even that portion of knowledge we have is so glorious. And the, the Bible said the Spirit was given unto Jesus without measure. But it's given unto us with measure. He had the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We get the Spirit of the Lord in a portion. We can enhance that portion. We can, we can vacate portions out of us to give him room to come in and bring more of himself into us. But, but we get it in, in, in a portion. And we have that great treasure. What a shame in an earthen vessel. Our spirits are redeemed. Our souls are redeemed. But we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to the redemption of our bodies. Our bodies are not yet redeemed. And I know that in my flesh, that is this body, there dwelleth no good thing except the Holy Ghost. And everything else has got to be surrendered to him. How, how strange we have this treasure in such earthen vessels. But the reason we do is that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Okay, let me read this to you. But this precious treasure, this light and power that now shine within us is held in a perishable container that is in our weak bodies. Everyone can see that the glorious power within must be from God and is not our own. It ain't us. It's him. That's why he goes on to say, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Okay? Taylor puts it on this wise. We are pressed on every side and troubled, we, but not crushed and broken. We are perplexed because we don't know why things happen as they do. But we don't give up and quit. We're perplexed. But we're not in despair. I don't understand. I don't know. I see in part. I know in part. I don't know what's happening. But I'm not in despair. Because I know he knows. I don't give up and quit. Because he knows the score. And, 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 and so I, I keep this treasure in this earthen vessel. I don't. I'm not sure about what time or season, and there's a whole lot I don't know and don't understand, but I don't quit, and I keep on walking, and I keep on talking, and I keep on trusting, because one of these days I'm going to grow up just like when I was a little boy, and I didn't understand why mama wouldn't give me two bucks, and I didn't understand why we didn't catch a taxi, and I didn't understand why there was dirt on the floors instead of carpet. I'm talking about not even concrete. I'm talking about dirt floors. And I didn't understand why my mother would cook food out of a Folgers coffee can. It's because that was the best she could do with what she had. But I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know why we didn't ride in cars like the other kids did. I didn't know. But now I've grown up. I know. I see. She was a poor woman. But I didn't know. I didn't fathom. It didn't bother me until I saw the other kids in their cars and their toys. And, 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 and we'd stand up in school and they'd talk about what they got for Christmas. And there was kids that, well, we went down to the Bahamas for Christmas. And what'd you do? <laughs> I got a yo-yo. I mean, but you grow. You grow. And you realize God is going to be good. God's going to be great. It's really something. If you've read the book, I'm sorry. I don't mean to bore you, but it's really something. Here I am about a, I know I'm in the ninth grade, 14, 15 years of age, and I have stripped my gears on inhalant drugs. 
and I'm, I'm in a nightmare of my life laying on this bed. Anyway, it's in the book. And when I, I make these promise after promise to God, I go back in and out of the nightmare all night long. God, I won't do this. God, I won't do that. God, I won't do this. God, I won't do that. And then I make my last promise to God. And I broke every last one up eventually. But I'd never shoot up anything in my arms. And it was I was about to finally drift off to the few moments left before the sun came up. I heard him say, when you are 18, you will begin to live for me. I wasn't baptized in Jesus' name to get the Holy Ghost until I was 19. But I did start taking steps. I began when I was 18. Just before I went to sleep, I heard that. But I never forgot it. I didn't plan on it. It was way back. It wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't write it on my mirror where I'd see it every day. No, 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 no. But there was a God that said when your seasons are bizarre and they're crazy and you're living out there like the devil and you're shooting cigarettes out of each other's mouths with 22 pistols and rifles, I still, my hand's on you. And I'm going to keep you for whatever reasons he saw. He saw. I'm saying all of this so that everybody under the sound of my... I know this is a Sunday night, very different message. But I feel like everybody just needs to take a breath and say, God, he's God. And me, I'm going to do the best I can with what I got. Thank you. But you don't have the answers. No, I really don't. I'm just, we just kind of making our way through life, doing the best we can. And the greatest thing we can do is take him by the hand. The greatest thing, the greatest thing that we can do. Is Riley awake? Is he asleep? Is, is Peyton awake? Is Trenton awake? All right, come here, Trenton. Come up, come, come up on hither. I have seen the time when... This little boy thought he knew everything. But I'm going to tell you, let's just say, let's just say this is the Grand Canyon. And if you fall off this, you're going to fall so far that you'll crash and burn, and we won't even be able to find the pieces. Let's just say that those cords right there are snakes. They're serpents. And their poisonous is all get out. You got it? Let's just say that that right there is a huge trap. And if you get too close to it, it's going to spring out and grab you. <laughs> Let's just say that, that those pillars right there, they're about to fall down. And if they fall down at the wrong place and wrong time, they'll conk you flatter in a flitter. And all these things are waiting to get you. And it's, and it's bad, and it's scary. Now, if that was real, all that was real, and your daddy was here, or your papa, and I were to say, you want to make it through here safe? Do you want to be safe? Hold my finger. Just hold my hand. Just walk with me. I'll guide you. We won't get too close. We'll be okay. Just walk with me. 
And watch out for that trap there. I know you don't understand how that works, but I do. So just hang on to my hand. And those, those serpents, they'll, they'll get you. And those pillars, woo! <laughs> They're on fire, dude. So we got to run quick. And if we do that, I want you to know Tim's been waiting to do that for months, brother. He has, he's been dying to do that for months. <laughs> All things cometh to him that waiteth, praise God. And so if you find somebody that maybe knows just a little bit more, understands a little bit better, they can walk you through keep you away from the traps and the snares and the cliffs and all of that and get you safely down or up and take you back safely to auntie <laughs> looking for mother to auntie and everybody under the sound of my voice, we all got to do that with Jesus. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your name is. I don't care how much we know the score. I'm going to tell you, everybody has to take him by the hand. I, I, I called Brother Joseph Conroy today. I caught him on the phone. And uh, I said, you preach something in our church. And uh, I remember the incident in this night. But I said, refresh my mind of some of the details. He said, I'll be happy to. Brother, musicians, please come. Brother Conroy, he used to live down by Del Rosa, which is not far from San Ysidro, which is, of course, by the border, Mexico. And he worked for a company that had been shorthanded, and they were having a good year, and... Uh, many, and there was a sickness that was going around at the time. And so the bottom line was he didn't have a day off for like three weeks. He had to work every day, maybe four. Also, during that time, because some guys wouldn't show up, he was working graveyard, period. But then he would have to many times work double shifts. So for three, four weeks at a time, he never got a day off, and many days he was doing 16-hour days. And he said, Brother Booker, he said, I was so exhausted. He said, I was, I was humdrum. And he, and he said, I could see, and they, and they would have a break at, at the end of, of his deal. And he said, in the office, I could see the boss talking on the phone. And while he's talking on the phone, he's looking at me. And he's thinking, I know what he's doing. He is, he's going to ask me to do another shift. So he went and he got his tray. He got food. He got his glass. He set it down. He looked around like he had forgot something. And the boss is watching him all the time. And he thought, he knows I'm going to eat. I'm not, he, I, I, I'm not leaving. And he went to go get something. He went to get his time card and he punched out and he ran and got in his car and took off. And uh, he said he was so exhausted. Of course, it was dark out, and he, and he had uh, the lights on. And, 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 and then the, the light, the uh, sun started coming up. And uh, so now he didn't need the headlights, but he wasn't thinking. Any. And uh, he pulls up. He doesn't shut his headlights off because he forgets about them being on. It was before the days. This was back in 1984. He had an older car, so it wasn't, it wasn't that it was going to be a bing, 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 and tell him he had his lights on. And so he goes into the house. He's so exhausted, he falls into bed, and he says, I'm going to lay here and sleep all day long. I'm going to sleep. Well, he got in his bed, and he slept about three or four hours and uh, it was July 18th, 1984, and he, he woke up three or four hours. But he said he was refreshed. And the main thing that he was refreshed about is because he knew, I don't have to go back to work till late tonight. I got a whole day here. I'm not working another shift. 
And he said, oh, he said he was a little hungry because he didn't eat his food. He, he left it. And, uh, and so he had it all planned out. He went, he went and picked out a good book that he'd been wanting to read. And uh, he was going to go down to McDonald's and, and he was going to sit there and, and order his burger fries and stuff and, and free refills. I mean, he, could, he said, I was going to sit there and I was going to read that book all day long. I was going to going to get those refills and said, when I got really tired, it's going to go home. So he said, I was so excited. Well, I went out to my car and it wasn't a case of it going, it was nothing, nothing at all. No lights, nothing dead, dead as a mackerel. And so he, he gets out and he, he lifts the, the hood and, and, uh, and, and the, he's thinking, oh man, this battery's dead. And then he looks and he sees the corrosion that's all around the battery post and he's thinking okay I got to get the corrosion off maybe it'll be okay and and so he's now he's going through his stuff he's trying to find a pair of pliers trying to find he couldn't find nothing if he'd had kids I know what would happen what happened but anyway he couldn't find he couldn't find anything and and so and so he says I'm just going to get I'll get these off so and he starts working twisting working gets a rag working twisting work and he just keeps going keeps going and finally he gets them off so then he, he takes, he's got the battery, and, and he's making his way across the way because there's a service station. He's carrying his bed, heavy, heavy, heavy battery. And he says, can you charge this up? And the guy said, yeah, we'll charge it up. And he said, okay, I'm going to come home, and I'll be back in about an hour. And he comes back in an hour, and the guy said, uh, your battery's ruined. You, you, you can't charge it up. He said, it's a good battery. I just bought it a while back. He said, I left my headlights on. That's what's wrong with that battery. He said, no, 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 your battery's broke. My battery's not broke. No, you've, done, you've had an accident. There's something wrong with your battery. He said, I just paid, I don't know how much money. I paid, I, I did And he said, no, come here, I'll show you. And he shows him, he says, your post here. He said, how'd you get this off? He said, well, I didn't have no tools. I twisted it off. He said, you broke the post, dude. He said, you broke the post. It is not going to charge your battery. He said, all right, all right. Give me another battery. I've had a lot of overtime. I can buy a stupid battery. He said, I ain't got a battery. He said, what do you mean you ain't got a battery? Not that battery. You got to have a certain battery for what you got to. What am I supposed to do? He said, I'll have it here tomorrow. Tomorrow morning if you want it. And he said, that town back in that time, there wasn't. And if he got a battery, he'd have to walk so far and carry it. And he didn't have AAA. And, and there was only two restaurants. One was a, a Mexican food restaurant, which is not really probably where you want to eat breakfast, unless it's the, the Brethren's Day here coming up. Praise God. And, um, and so he, he, he's just so frustrated. He's so frustrated. And he's, and he's thinking, I was going to go to McDonald's. I was going to sit there. I was going to have a good time. And he says, he goes out to his car, and he knows, and he said he kicked his car. He said, God, I don't understand this. I'm faithful to you. I don't miss church. I pay my tithes. You told me that you would rebuke the devourer for my sake. And he said, Brother Booker, I heard him. It was a still, small voice that said, I have Well, it don't look like it to me. So he walks down to the Mexican food restaurant. He should have been sitting back. Didn't have his book. Didn't have. Could have been sitting in McDonald's. Could have been sitting there by now. By this time, four or five chapters into the book, really good. And when if he got thirsty, go get another Coke. And he said. He's in the Mexican food restaurant, and he notices a sheriff's car <laughs> speeding by. He's in a hurry. Then another, then another. And then a cop car, and then ambulances, and then a SWAT team. And then he starts hearing helicopters. By that time, the owner of the restaurant is looking around. People are looking out the windows. And he said, I don't know what's going on, but, boy, there is something big. About that time, the restaurant owner... His son came running in. Daddy, 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 turn on the TV, daddy. So they had a, a TV up there in the corner, and he, and he turned it on. And 
It was July 18th, 1984. A man named James Huberty had taken many guns. One of them was a 9mm Uzi submachine gun. And he went to the McDonald's where Brother Conroy was headed. And he shot 22 people to death and injured another 19 before they finally got him. And he said, I understood why when I was kicking my car and mad at God because he hadn't rebuked the devourer that the Lord said, I have. He said, Brother Booker, I'd have been right in the middle of it. He said, I knew a girl that worked there. Her best friend was in my church. I mean, her brother was my best friend. And he was in our church. His name was Jaime. And he thought, oh God, Jaime's sister is dead. Jaime's had me pray for her dozens of times. He's had the church pray. Everybody's prayed for his sister. He said, finally, I called Jaime. Let's stand. He said, when Jaime answered the phone, he said, Hey, Joseph, how you doing? Fine. You okay, Jaime? Oh, yeah, I'm doing fine. And he thought, either he hasn't heard, but he said, Jaime, have you heard about McDonald's? He goes, oh, yes. He said, isn't that horrible? He said, Jaime, what about your sister? He said, oh, man, you ain't going to believe what I'm fixing to tell you. He said, my sister lives right by, I mean right by. She walks close. She, it's a short, short walk every day. She's worked at that McDonald's for three or four years. And said, yesterday, they came to her and said, we are transferring you to the North San Diego store there's been some pilfering in the tills, and we have confidence in you that you can fix it. She said, the reason I work at McDonald's is because it's right there. I walk to work. I can't drive all the way to North San Diego to go to work. And he said, but you've got to. You've been transferred. We, we have to have you up there. And she said, I'm not doing it. He said, then don't show up at work. Because you either go to the store in North San Diego or you're fired. And Brother Jaime said, Joe, you should have heard my sister. Said, now you know she ain't got the Holy Ghost yet. Said, last night she stomped around our house. She cursed. She yelled. She screamed and said, why ain't you praying for me? Our church is praying. Well, it don't sound like it. I'm getting shoved off the... And said, but she shut her mouth and got in the car and she drove to the McDonald's. Said she'd come home crying. And said, Jaime, thank you for praying for me. Because I'd have been dead like every other person that worked there except for one boy that hid in the cellar. We know in part, we see in part, we understand in part. There's so much we can't pick up on. But I'm going to tell you something. We better put our hands in the hands of Jesus and say, Jesus, walk me through this world. Walk me through the shoals. Walk me through the traumas. Walk me through the trials and troubles and tribulations. Get me somehow between the rocks and the cliffs and the snakes and the traps and the just help me, Jesus, some way, somehow. I know this is a very different message. But it means something to know that God knows your name. And God knows where you are. And you can trust him. Is there anybody here today maybe you'd like to get a firmer grip? Or there may be somebody here 
You've lived your life in this world all by yourself long enough. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother that's in this house tonight. He'll love you, sir. He'll love you, ma'am. He'll help you like you can't even begin to imagine if you just let him. He knows where you are. He's here to help you. He's here to help you. Come on, sir. Come on, ma'am. I just felt like talking to you from my heart. I feel like the Lord is here to talk to us and help us. Come on. Without Him, we'll make a botch of everything. Through Him, I can do all things. We got to trust Him. We got to love Him. We got to lean on Him. Come on, sir. Who is this that comes up out of the wilderness leaning on her beloved? 